Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor, your host for episode 86. Hope everybody's doing okay under the current circumstances. Wanted to focus this show a little bit about what's going on in the world and give you a little bit of thought about the EV marketplace and the EV revolution based on what we're going through and where we might end up. So I hope you find this show informative. And of course, I hope everybody stays safe and uh, is following what uh, officials and governments are asking you to do. Please, we all have to go through this together and we will go through this. Now, I know um, from my last show, I had a lot of people <laughs> email me and send some comments about, um, you know, that it's not going to get that, that it's going to get a lot worse and that there's going to be millions and millions of people that could be infected. And yes, that could be true, but we have to stay positive, folks, and we have to look at what's going on um, and what what governments need to do to help combat this. And we all have a part to play, so let's play those parts. But anyway, let me get to some stories which I think you're going to find interesting today. Now, these stories that I'm going to talk about are related to COVID-19 from the perspective of um, giving you some thought about the spread of the contagion. All right, so this story talks about something called contagion vectors. And relative to COVID-19 and to really all kinds of bacteria and germs that are out there, it's interesting when you look at the life cycle or the fuel, the life cycle for the, the chain for fuel. And if we look at fuel for internal combustion vehicles, we look at from when the crude oil is, is pumped uh, from a well into the point of where it's pumped into your car or into the vehicle. If we follow that chain of events, we start at the crude oil stage where, you know, the oil is pumped. Um, so there's a lot of human interactions at these sources. And then, you, of course, that there's trucks and there's pipelines and boats that carry this crude oil to refineries. And refineries are generally fairly manned and personnel as well with crews that have to work the machine, the equipment. And, um, you know, there's lunch rooms in these places. There's <laughs> a gathering places. I mean, you know, these are these are big, big factories, basically. Basically, right for doing what they do so again more vectors of potential uh, disease transmission then you look at again that refined gasoline now has to get shipped again it gets put into trucks and ships and pipelines in some cases and so you've got all that that human interaction and then they get to gas stations eventually they get come in a truck and it gets pumped into the the tanks at the local gas station so there's that interaction, which can be very brief. Some of the things to think about at the pump itself. But of course, you have that that's a very common physical place, right? Well, lots of people come to put gas in their car. More vectors, more contagion vectors is what I want you to kind of think about. So this is all so that your car can get from home to get some groceries and back home or whatever the case is. That's the whole chain of events or the chain of that process when you think about contagion vectors. So if we look at the alternative, which is EVs, and of course their fuel supply is electricity. So again, I'm taking out of the equation the manufacturing aspect of vehicles and anything to do with the vehicles themselves. I'm just talking about the fuel aspect of vehicles here, okay, folks? In a lot of countries, they, the power comes from wind and solar. Uh, and these, you know, these wind farms and solar farms, they just sit there and they do their thing. They're relatively unmanned or very, very small staffing that mans that. Now, of course, there are nuclear power plants and cold fire plants as well and hydro dams. But I would anticipate that they're not as uh, staffed as heavily. And certainly nuclear power plants have staff. And so you can you can add that into the equation and personnel. It's most likely going to be less people touching that part of the electricity generation or the, the source of the electricity than, say, in an oil equivalent platform, in a crude oil platform and refinery. There's no refining of the electricity, it's just generated and then it's shot out of the grid over transmission lines, power lines, all kinds of things. And there's relatively little human interaction at that point, other than maybe operation centers, which are manned. And of course, field staff that have to go out and repair and, and augment and replace and uh, do all do that for power sites. So it's a handful of people in offices, not hundreds of people on work sites when you look at that comparison. So then it gets to, of course, to um, the EV stations, or in this case, most people charge at home. The vast majority of EV owners still charge at home today. And home is a very limited use case as far as transmission of germs and things like that. It's, it's a limited number of people that are actually touching the handle for the EVSE charger and plugging it in and working the EV. It's only a few people probably in a house, maybe one or two people. So you can take a lot more human interaction out of the equation with electric cars. So I think the point of what I'm trying to see here is that there's a lot 
fewer opportunities for transmission of disease in renewably powered electric vehicle world when you think of that foot that chain of events there that has to happen because there's right there's a, a lot a less human interaction it lowers of course the chances of any transmissions now if i carry that story a little bit further and i zoom in on the gas uh, pump perspective at the gas stations and i look at that it's some interesting studies at some material that i received um, and this is a, a, a study that was done by Kimberly Clark in 2015. Of course, it probably could be updated quite a lot by now. But, you know, what we're going through right now with this pandemic is forcing us to look at best hygiene practices, right? You've heard now over and over again on the media outlets, wash your hands, wash it for 20 seconds or more, you know, do a proper job, wipe things down, stay at home, all these kind of things that we're going through. Well, when you look at the bacteria and, and the potential for germs, and transmissions of diseases at the pump, it's quite outstanding. Now this chart shows um, the what's called colony forming units, uh, CFUs, and this is per square inch of touch space uh, in uh, gas pumps and electric charger handles and, and the machinery involved that you have to interface with. And you can see that regular gas uh, has an average of about over 5 million uh, germs or CFUs per square inch. And then premium gas, the number is going to be lower, is just over 4 million um, colony forming units per square inch. But look at that EV handle or that whole EV car charger, just under 8,000. And again, it's not to say that they're impervious. That's not what I'm trying to imply. I'm just trying to play the odds here if you look at look at that and look at that, all the processes involved. It just really proves, again, that going electric is cleaner than just greenhouse gas emissions and, and other health benefits. So um, that's going to help the cause as far as being able to distance yourself from particular germs and stuff as you go through these processes. So uh, again, something else to think about. And finally, on this three-part kind of angle that I'm talking about today, how do, how do we think maybe the EV revolution might... Um, will change from the the, the coronavirus uh, crisis that we're experiencing today. Like, what could happen? I mean, obviously, the financial impacts that we're just starting to feel, we're in the early grasp of this, and it's going to get worse, folks, before it gets better, but it will get better. You know, a lot of the auto uh, manufacturers are closing plants or they're laying off people or they're downsizing um, because we know right now that car sales are tanking. Um, I just listened to Robert uh, Fully Charged Live. He did a live broadcast today and he mentioned the same thing. It's just basically the car industry has come to almost a standstill. Um, and that's obviously with EVs uh, and, and, and all that. So as this crisis goes on, you know, these companies have to deal with it. And this is a great opportunity, again, once we come out of this for those to reorganize or rebuild around becoming electric leaders. And I don't know if a lot of them will. VW, of course, has already started to go down that, but that was a result of a crisis of their own, right? The diesel emission crisis. That forced their hand, really, to get into this EV mentality and this all-in mentality that they're in now. So, you know, Ford has come out, GM has come out with announcements about taking electrification seriously. However, I, I fear that they may not look really, really take it seriously enough to transition quick enough. Um, and, you know, there is going to be a, a wave of market transition and a lot of these OEMs may get left behind. So uh, certainly the EV industry will be something that people will be look, looking forward to when we get out of this, probably more so because the, the awareness, I think, in all things health benefit, health will be a lot higher. And we've been talking about health benefits and, uh, you know, with, with not only with climate change, but just, you know, uh, lungs and, and diseases and things like that, you know, uh, particulates in the atmosphere and, and other pollution for decades and decades. So, you know, hopefully that'll hammer home. And I really hope that um, OEMs do take this seriously when they are looking to come out of this and think about the future. Now, I just talked about the future of electrification, especially how some OEMs will come out of that some of the vendors, but how will Tesla do? Um, you know, Tesla's in an interesting situation being basically a market leader. Tesla ride out this, and I've been watching some discussion forums and listening to some podcasts and things like that. A lot of people talking about the stability of Tesla. Um, well, let me give you my viewpoints on this. Now, whether it's, it's you know, uh, Elon had, had a crystal ball and was looking ahead or had somebody give him a premonition, um, Tesla has been doing some things which uh, inadvertently they probably didn't know is putting them in a better position now for what we're going through. One of those things being last year in 2019, they laid off about 7% of their full-time workforce or about 3,000 people. And that was in an effort to streamline the company to prepare for some of the rough times ahead. 
Um, it was really in conjunction with what happened in Oct later in 2019 in October as they continued to really rein in spending and cut costs because they wanted to be more efficient as a from a balance sheet perspective that Tesla is aiming to do. You know, they have a very positive balance sheet at the at the latter part of 2019 with $5.3 billion um, in growth uh, mode. They spent about $400 million in the last quarter or for that quarter, October 2019, um, compared to the $5.3 billion. So definitely a very positive balance sheet as they continue to move forward. Uh, Tesla uh, reiterated the fact that they've had multiple quarters of strong cash generation, improvements to capital efficiencies, and continued improvement in product and operational costs, you know, bringing those costs down, bringing more efficiencies with that to provide positive GAAP or gap net income uh, and as they continue forward. So the, again, strengthening their balance sheet, strengthening their financial portfolio. Now in February of 2020, Tesla, Tesla went out and raised $2.3 billion in cash. Now this is just, you know, obviously COVID-19 was out for about a month or two, uh, impacted China right away during the month of January. So either Tesla saw something, you know, that could come out of this and said, look, we better get in a better cash position or for whatever reasons, they went out and looked at more cash and they raised $2.3 in cash, uh, which made their total position in February of uh, just under $9 billion, $8.6 billion. Uh, and Tesla, of course, has continued over the last six months or so to continue to lower their costs, their operating costs, increase their efficiency so that their cash burn is really, really modest compared relative to the immediate drop in production as we're seeing now with current cutbacks and closures. So they were already putting themselves in a very um, uh, lucrative position to ride out a financial storm or a drop in product in product need for lack of better words, closures of plants, not being able to sell anything, not being able to produce some revenue, they were putting themselves in a position to ride that out for some time, either knowingly or unknowingly, or a little bit of both, I think. And if we look at something called liquidity ratio, that measures the company's ability to pay short-term obligations, you'll see that they fare very, very well against the OEMs. And that's an important factor for that, for looking at the ability to have cash on hand to be able to spend, to keep, you know, keep paying payrolls and minimum, even minimum staffing letters, keep paying light and power and all that stuff for buildings and, and things. Now they, you know, of course, they still have other uh, other elements that are going, but they have cut back. Now, if you look at debt, you know, uh, and debt's pretty straight, straightforward, you know, how much debt do you have versus how much income do you have? You'll see um, that the OEM's debt in billions in this chart here. Uh, that Tesla is really not at risk of losing money anytime soon or running out of money, even with a Fremont shutdown that they're having to do now. You know, their debt is very low compared to their cash on hand, so they have a, a good amount of time to be able to ride that out. Now, China has kind of weathered the COVID-19 storm and is coming out of it. And in this case, the uh, Shanghai plant is now operational and at full production capacity. Now, they already delivered almost 4,000 vehicles currently for March, you know, the first couple of weeks of March, even with all this going on in China with the shutdowns. So more will expect Now, 4,000 isn't a lot, but it's something. So that just shows that Tesla can still get some sources of income from China while some of their US, uh, the US holdings are shut down or not really able to produce. Um, of course, I talked about the Model Y delivery is already starting. Uh, they, they've produced a lot of those cars. They have a lot of them sitting that are waiting to fill orders. There will come a point if the shutdowns continue for quite some time that they won't be able to fill any back orders or any uh, reservations for some of the newer models. They'll just only be able to fill mod uh, orders for what they have on hand for inventory, including Model 3, X, S, uh, and of course the Y. They will, you know, the longer this takes, the more likelihood that that could happen. Um, I, the summary of this whole article here is that Tesla is in a very, very good position uh, from an, not only from an EV manufacturer, but just from an OEM in general to ride out this storm uh, really well and to be able to come back very strong. All right, so I hope you found that information uh, in informative, that data informative around, around what's going on with the crisis and some different ways to look at it from the things that we are following this whole EV marketplace and EV industry. I hope you found that interesting because I certainly did when I came upon these articles and was doing a lot of reading. Switch gears to just a couple of quick um, stories that I picked up which are kind of off the norm. There's not a lot of new car announcements and stuff coming out. Yeah, some more PHEVs that are thinking of and rumors and 
Mercedes and this and that. I'm not, I, don't, I don't report on speculation or rumors, folks. I like to report on facts. So until I hear stuff that are facts and that get me excited, I'm not going to bring it to you guys. But, but this was pretty cool. Uh, the launch uh, and the commission of Japan's first submarine that runs partially on lithium-ion batteries, which is pretty cool. This is the first application of lithium-ion batteries in a military uh, vessel, uh, in a submarine that I'm aware of, especially in Japan. Japan's Maritime Self-Defense Force uh, launched their first submarine using lithium-ion batteries um well it's part of their 11th uh, soyu class boat it's uh, it does have a diesel engine it's a diesel electric attack sub called the uh, Auru, if i pronounce that right um it as i mentioned it runs lithium nickel cobalt aluminum oxide or nca batteries in this thing and the technology requires less maintenance it's capable of longer endurance at high speeds um, what are some of the other benefits? Um, and of course, the maintenance is a lot less, as I mentioned, for these for these battery packs versus some of the older lead acid battery types. Um, this class of submarine displaces 2,900 tons uh, surfaced and 4,200 tons submerged, measuring about 275 feet. Top speed 13 knots on top of the water, 20 knots underneath or submerged, has a crew of about 65. So again, just cool to see. Where lithium ion and where these batteries uh, technologies, not just farming equipment and cars and trucks, but all kinds of other places. And my final uh, article today, the uh, segment that I want to talk about is fascinating piece of history that I just kind of stumbled across um, in, in perusing websites. I had no idea that Briggs and Stratton, yes, Briggs and Stratton, the guys that you probably know that build very small engines, most likely for your snowblower or lawnmower in most countries. Well, they actually came out with a hybrid concept back in the 1980s. This was before the Toyota Prius came to uh, on scene and even before the GM EV1. Um, and it's very interesting that this was probably the, the grandfather of plug-in hybrids uh, because it really was a plug-in hybrid. So it was called the hybrid. Boy, an original name at the time. And as you can see by the pictures and video that are, that are here, it had six wheels, which made it pretty unique. Now, <clears throat> the, the specs on this thing is pretty wild uh, for the time. But remember, again, this is after the fuel crisis in the 70s. Um, so, you know, automakers were scrambling to get more fuel efficient cars because that's what people wanted. And of course, battery technology was still very, very uh, old. It was still based. It basically hadn't evolved much uh, from, from an EV perspective since the 1890s, you know, really, and, and throughout the, those decades. But this was quite advanced um, for its time. It had a parallel drive system. What that meant is that the driver could switch manually whether the uh, vehicle would be powered by electricity only, by the batteries, or by the gasoline engine, uh, which was pretty cool, or both. So it could, it could run in parallel as well, in a, in a combo mode. Now, the kicker to this, it could go up to 60 miles. 60 miles, folks, a fully electric. And this is, you know, this is a, a 40 years ago, this vehicle. And we have plug-in hybrids today that don't even come close to that, uh, which, again, I've talked about on many shows, which I find totally, totally disheartening that we can't get really proper uh, range pl pl uh, plug-in hybrid vehicles today. But anyway, that's another story. 60 miles um, with nearly 1,000 pounds of lead-acid batteries. Hey, that doesn't sound that far from battery packs today, which are easily in the 8, 900, 1,000, 1,200, 1,500 pound range, depending on the size so they were right there um, and it had an 18 1 8 horsepower uh, mo electric motor so not a really big electric motor by today's stand uh, well, of course now those batteries uh, were carried independently as you can see by the video and pictures uh, by the rearmost axle so that's why it had two rear axles the rearmost axle carried the weight of the batteries while the axle ahead of that acted as the drive axle for propulsion there was a rear wheel drive and for the of course holding up the rest of the car as well taking that weight uh, the engine in this, as I mentioned, was 18 horsepower, 694 cc, two-cylinder air-cooled Briggs & Stratton engine, which a clutch, of course, that you could engage the four-speed manual a transmission, of course, uh, and all this kind of stuff. Now, a lot of the parts for this vehicle uh, were borrowed from other cars, uh, parts from the Ford Pinto. Boy, I remember the Ford Pinto. Boy, I'm sure people are, are having visions of that. The Volkswagen Scirocco as well. There's a lot of components there and all kinds of other things. Now, they were they were not trying to build a car. And Briggs and Stratton admits that they weren't trying to get into the car industry. They were just trying to show what could be what could happen when you looked at taking motors and batteries and putting them together in in better MPGs and more efficient vehicles. Now, this car runs on 72 volts. 
It has 12 6 volt lead acid batteries. Um, now, this isn't a uh, this doesn't have uh, any internal means. The engine does not charge the battery, but there is a 110 volt AC socket, so you can charge the battery, uh, the battery pack. But the hybrid concept apparently was later updated to add regenerative braking. So again, something that they were a little bit ahead of the time on. Um, top speed 68 miles an hour that's pretty good for a vehicle like this um, again with with an 18 horsepower engine weighing about 3200 pounds um, so it was really to to kind of break down those performance based barriers so that customers could appreciate an electric car as a primary personal car hmm boy 40 years later does that ever ring true that statement today anyway really good on them i encourage you to check it out and just you learn a little bit of history by watching what's uh, what what has what has happened in the past and where we can learn from and how things can repeat so fascinating story and i hope you find that interesting all right and that's it for this edition of the ev revolution show i hope you enjoyed it i hope i give you a little bit more stuff to think about and to keep you calm and again everybody stay safe during these times I want to thank everybody that does watch the youtube channel and comments and likes subscribes all that kind of stuff please subscribe if you haven't i would appreciate it if you could um i won't you won't get spammed with a lot of stuff and it is free to subscribe of course always a heartfelt thanks for for my patreon supporters i continue to get messages of encouragement from you folks and thank you very much for your support. It does mean a lot to me, um, especially now that we're all kind of hunkered down at home and uh, I'm able to kind of focus on uh, doing a bit more uh, working from home stuff and trying to get some shows going as well from a limited uh, capabilities that I can. So I do appreciate that. Um, of course, everybody, please keep the faith, stay safe. And, you know, there is a lot going on still in the electric revolution in the electric vehicle revolution to be specific and keep watching, keep seeing what's going on. Things will slow down a bit. There's no doubt about about that folks but we will again we will come out of this i think a better uh, a better society and a better planet i'm hoping and i think what the outcome of what we're going through now will certainly get more awareness to electric vehicles and to climate change and to all these things that we have that we really need to tackle to get human nature kind of going and uh, to make us a better better planet so everybody have that food for thought stay safe and again um, keep the faith you know glad that i'm here to help educate minds one tailpipe at a time if you have questions or comments my contact information is coming up send me emails uh, reach out on on the uh, youtube of course in the comments and let me know your thoughts i appreciate that so until the next show please everybody stay safe and i'll see you when i see you take care bye bye